that we'll go talk today about some of the tools for genetic improvement in breeding programs um, and some of the, the thought behind those and, and then some discussion on how to apply them. So I think the, the benefit of selective breeding is well established at this point. Um, there's a lot of valuable information that could be valuable productivity that can be gained by genetic improvement and it's related to the genetic generation interval. And if you focus in more of the modern era of breeding, it's really about selecting changes in DNA. And we've got a lot more information and insight what's happening there and how those changes can improve performance of specific traits. And so we can consider the whole genome, which is all the chromosomes and DNA of an organism and how best to select for changes there that lead to increased performance. So these changes that occur are called variants in the DNA. And there's, a, there's many types of variants that can occur from very simple changes. So a single base pair change or single letter change in the DNA, and this is called a SNP or single nucleotide polymorphism. This is the most common DNA variant. Uh, you can also have insertions or deletions in the sequence of DNA, and then larger structural variants and rearrangements within the DNA. But in spite of this focus on variants, they're very relatively rare. Uh, humans are 99.9% .9 identical at the DNA level. And so all the phenotypic differences in humans that we can see with each other, except now we can't see it because we're all sharing, uh, we're on a video call that's got the cameras hidden. But if you look around to your colleagues, that's just based on 0.1% or less of the changes in DNA. Um, and even chimpanzees and humans are largely identical. So it's these variants that drive phenotypes. And from a breeding perspective, these are the variants we're interested in to give improved performance. So selective breeding takes advantage of this. And so the shrimp genome was sequenced recently. And so for perspective, it's got 1.6 billion letters in the DNA. And there's 26,000 genes. And of these, there's millions of SNPs. So you know, 10 to 15 million SNPs are there. Um, and because they're relatively numerous, a variant that's relatively numerous, they're the marker of choice and are frequently used to enhance genetic improvement in selective breeding programs. So the SNP markers allow us to detect variants, they are a variant, and they can also help us predict when other types of variation is there in the genome. And so we use them both um, specifically and to help us infer when changes have occurred that we can use for breeding, breeding progress. So this is quite profound, of course, just, just over time selecting for phenotypic changes, um, you can make a, breeders can make a huge difference. The, the best example is the wild mustard plant domesticated around 2000 years ago along the Mediterranean. And over time, these vegetables were all the same species, but it's selected for different variations in the DNA by, by teasing apart differences in the appearance of the plants and has created multiple different vegetables that look quite different and taste different also. And we have another good example in our best friend in, in dog breeds. It's all the same species. Variation of the DNA has been selected over time to create quite different phenotypes. The, the downside of this takes a very long time because we, don't, we can't see into the DNA, but we can, we can still select for these variants by looking at phenotypes. And that formed the basis for breeding for thousands and thousands of years. But now we can start looking at the DNA. So if we use these SNPs, there are little markers in the DNA, there's a one base pair change. And so if you think of them like a little lamp there, where there's a SNP, we can see the SNP and also the surrounding DNA and make predictions about that DNA. And so if you have quite a few SNPs, you can start to see a pattern that's in an individual's DNA. And in this case, we would call a low density SNP panel, <clears throat> would consist of around, let's say, 192 SNPs, 100 to 200 SNPs. And that allows us to make advances in breeding, regardless of the type of breeding program that you have. And of course, even though DNA is largely similar, these SNPs help us see where there are differences, and we can begin to differentiate between individuals. And this gives us power in breeding programs. So for example, if you genotype or look at the SNP patterns for lots of individuals in a population, and they're all very similar, and, you know, the calculations can indicate that's an example of inbreeding and loss of diversity in a population, which would be a bad thing. And if you have a lot of diversity in the SNPs per individual, then you can be comfortable that you have good diversity and low inbreeding. Similarly, you can look at lines or strains or even subspecies and look at using just a few SNPs 
using the structure of the populations. And so you can see in this case, there's a breeding program that's maintaining 14 lines and they're all largely similar uh, versus another program where they've got 10 lines, each is genetically unique. So you have the ability now to take a step, uh, get, take a step more toward informative decisions in your breeding populations, even if they're relatively simple programs that focus on mass selection. You can also do things, you can also assign progeny to parents. So if you know the SNP pattern of the parents, so in this case, the female has two red SNPs and the, and the male has two yellow SNPs. The progeny you can differentiate, this is a very simplified view, and using these slow density SNP panels and figure out which progeny came from which parents, which can be extremely valuable in an aquaculture operation when you're looking at groups of fish and to try to figure out which families perform the best. And as you move forward, and thinking about how to use the genome and leverage a genome. We have low density SNP panels and we also have high density SNP panels. This can be 50,000 SNPs. So you have a bigger density of, of these lamps. They can cover and help you see pretty much predict the entire genome. And this gives you much more power for more sophisticated breeding applications. So in this case, you can use these high density panels to phenotype animals for a trait. Let's say you're looking at disease resistance or you know, feed conversion ratio. Um, take a look at each individual with these 50,000 SNPs scanning the entire genome, and then you can begin to find SNPs that are predictive of a trait. And this is very valuable because in your breeding programs, you can take, um, if you know SNPs that you can measure that predict performance in your breeding population, you can go through test and genotype the parents and genotype their progeny and pick the progeny that have these markers that you know will speed up um, advancement in your trait of interest. So that's a that's an extremely powerful application of high density genotyping. Um, and the other application has now been proven quite extensively in aquaculture to be effective is looking at genomic selection. So in this case, rather than looking for specific markers, you can build a model of the entire genome. And in this case, if you have uh, a breeding population in a nucleus, and you have uh, fish or shrimp that you send out for disease testing or other phenotype collection, rather than bringing those fish back into the nucleus, you can genotype those fish and bring the genomic information back into the nucleus and use that to select your breeding candidates. So in this way, you can maintain the biosecurity of your breeding nucleus, at the most basic level, but this is also a more accurate method for selecting future broodstock and increases the, the rate of genetic gain per generation. And I should note that there's a medium density panel that you can use that's between the, the 200 SNPs and 50,000 SNPs. So it's around 2,000 SNPs that can also be part of this process and has application in, in aquaculture breeding as well. And if you take even further, can we push, can we push the envelope further looking to the future? If we have these high density panels of 50,000 SNPs, um, that's great and covers the entire genome but with new technologies in sequencing, and in particularly sequencing the whole genome and using some imputation background technologies, you can begin to look at millions of SNPs. And so now you've got the genome covered in detail, and you're looking at a lot of the variation is captured in your genotyping assay. And this allows you to take the additional step, not just of finding SNPs that can predict traits, but actually finding the causative variants specifically. And so, the, the depth of knowledge here and the knowledge that we're accumulating is astounding. So we know we can begin to see what genetic changes are driving the trait. And once we understand that, of course, that's of great value for a breeding program. We can begin to select those variants where we see them. But it also opens the door to what Dr. Lauf was talking about this morning. This fundamental understanding of the genetic architecture of a trait can allow you to look at recreating those causative variants. And so this occurs through genome editing. So in a normal selective breeding program, you have to you make a certain amount of gain per, inter, per generation interval. And so you have a ratchet that you turn and you make, a, make progress each generation and it's highly effective. The promise of genome editing is you can take a giant step because if you understand the variant, rather than randomly finding it and selecting for it in your population, you can create it in your population. So you just speed up the process of identifying variants and incorporating them in, in, their, in your population. And so the promise of this is significant, of course. So you, know, you, can, you can make 20 generations of gains in a single generation 
if you understand the genetic architecture of a trait that you're interested in. And this works very similar to how random DNA variants occur. So nothing, there's no new DNA being added here, and there's nothing that wouldn't, couldn't occur in nature. We're just understanding the process and facilitating the creation of those variants that we know are linked or causative for a trait. And the way this works is you have this genome again where we have these 1.6 billion letters. As we gain genomic information and we understand this specific region out of all this giant genome is what we're interested in. And if we could, if a variant is there, then we can predict a phenotype that's beneficial for aquaculture productivity or for the environment. So we can then use a technology called CRISPR-Cas9, and there's other technologies as well. This is one example. And this technology can then be directed specifically where this enzyme binds exactly in that one spot that we understand is important and creates a, a simple way of thinking about it, it creates a cut that, that then the cell repairs and this creates the variant. And you can use this to be predictable and precise in creating the variants that will lead to a preferred phenotype. So again, this is there's no new DNA added. This is an enzymatic reaction and recreating the type of variation that you might expect to find naturally and randomly over time in a breeding program. So the way this works is basically you inject these enzymes in a newly fertilized eggs. This is an example from our laboratory team where they're injecting shrimp eggs, um, but the process is very similar for, for whatever species that you're working with. And the applications are of course significant. So you can imagine influencing growth rates, resistance to diseases, sterility, as Xavier talked about, other uh, more um, uh, consumer orienting uh, traits like flesh quality and nutrition and feed conversion efficiency. And, and, and also you can focus on environmental applications and sustainability. So this is, a, this is not meant to replace breeding tools that we already have, but rather it's another tool in the toolbox. It's a supplement to the normal breeding program where for a specific trait, you can, in, you can create significant advancement in a, in a very short period of time. So summing up here, and I'm going fast because I know we're behind time a little bit, um, the tools for genetic improvement in aquaculture are significant now. The first written document on fish culture was from China in 475 BC, where they were domesticating carp. Um, and we have been modifying genes either and, and selecting variants ever since, initially by just looking at the animals and measuring traits. Um, and in the more modern time, we were looking at the genome and looking at genotyping tools to facilitate this. And the next step will be creating the variant specifically in the genome. And all of these tools will be important as we go forward. Whether you have a mass selection program, you've moved to family breeding, or you're doing more advanced technologies like genomic selection and, and genome editing. I'll also note that for aquaculture, of course, cost-effective solutions are essential. And I know our company and many other groups out there are working on ways to bring these technologies to aquaculture in a cost-effective manner. There are lots of animals that we need to be able to, to uh, assess and measure. And I don't wanna leave out the part where the phenotypes are very important. So in addition to these interesting genomic tools, focus on great phenotypic data is gonna be a key. Um, and then over on the right here, I have some examples of the types of tools we talked about today. So there's low density SNP panels, medium density SNP panels, and high density SNP panels, and they have different applications depending on the breeding program that a, a group is using. Um, and we talked, talked about whole genome sequencing, which can really get us to millions of SNPs per individual. You know, typically, we're, we're getting around four to five million SNPs per individual. And then genome editing, which is this coming technology that's going to be an important tool in how we think about genetic improvement for aquaculture. And on the right there, I've got some examples of pricing for shrimp. So this is for Vaname. Um, and this is an example where if you get a bunch of people together that all use the same tools, of course, the tool is not as important as the execution and strategy and phenotyping. So if we can all use the same tools, the scale is significant enough and we can, we're able to, to develop tools that are cost effective. And so, you know, there's a sort of a movement sometimes to have a proprietary tool, but our stance is really um, if we can get the, the community together to develop a tool that's useful for everyone to go take to their specific applications, it can really be an important move the needle on, on cost and really bring these technologies to aquaculture. So with that, I think that's the end.
Um, if you have any questions, please enter them in the chat. We'll try to answer them. We have a little bit of time here for questions at the end of the session. Um, and I think, yeah, that's, that's my presentation. Thanks, everybody.